You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials or even starting to appear on shelves or by prescription or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoyed the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you. Hello, this is Richard Jacobs with the Future Tech and Future Tech Health podcast. I have Dr. Gerardo Ceballos. Uh, he had an undergraduate degree in biology from uh, the Metropolitan Autonomous University uh, campus, well, in Mexico. I won't be able to pronounce it. Um, he's worked in collaboration with uh, Professor Paul Ehrlich, uh, an outstanding ecologist. And so I wanted to talk to uh, Dr. Ceballos about his current work and uh, perhaps his work with uh, Paul Ehrlich. So, Dr. Ceballos, thanks for coming. How are you doing? Oh, well, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here with you. Yeah, if you would tell me about your current research, what does it involve? Okay, uh, as you said, basically what I, I do in my lab in Mexico City is basically three things. On the one hand, we develop a, a basic science on ecology and conservation, and the, probably the most important thing we're doing right now is a couple of, of uh, projects. One is a global project on the patterns of distribution of all the vertebrates mammals, birds, amphibians, reptiles, and so on. So to uh, understand what are the most uh, critical areas for conservation of uh, species that are becoming extinct. And in the same line, I have been working with Paul Ehrlich, as you said, and other colleagues, and evaluating how bad is the population and extinction crisis, the current population and extinction crisis. And uh, we will talk about that a little bit later. Uh, and uh, then uh, I'm working uh, also and ecology of endangered species like the jaguar in the country to understand what are the habitat requirements, what are the population sizes. And based on that, we do the second thing in my lab that is a, a, a conservation in situ. We work to set aside protected areas and to set aside and to do a management plan for endangered species like the jaguar. And finally, I work, uh, I try to work with the government to try to develop uh, public policies in terms of the environment, especially for the conservation of biodiversity in Mexico and elsewhere. So what have you noticed first in looking at the distribution of various animals in a given, in a given area? What do you see that you didn't see before? Well, that's a, a good question. Well, first of all, uh, because I have been able to get access to large databases of the International Union for Conservation of Nature, Bird Life, and other organizations. We have been able to pull out together the distribution of uh, uh, 30,000 vertebrates, land vertebrates on Earth. And this is the first time that you can visualize in just one map the distribution of a massive amount of a species. And uh, the one thing that we have been able to see, and although we expect it because we have seen this uh, before partially, is that there is a huge concentration of some of these uh, animals in the tropics. For instance, uh, um, based on our database, we can now tell you that the uh, uh, forest in the Amazon forest, the fires, were in, in, uh, are incredibly disruptive because it's uh, uh, one of the three most diverse uh, areas, regions in the whole world. So just to give you an idea, in a 100 by 100 square mile grid, you may be having probably three, 4,000 species of vertebrates, many of them endangered with extinction. So when you have a fire like the ones that we have been seeing in the last months, 
you are eradicating whole populations of a species, many of them already in danger of extinction. So um, this is the one thing we have uh, first been able to look at, broad patterns of distribution that can guide us our conservation action. The other interesting thing in this, uh, 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 with these uh, maps and with uh, this analysis is uh, that we are able to pull out all just endangered species, for instance, and then to compare the distribution of endangered species with problems like uh, how much agriculture or pasture or urbanization is in the globe. And what we have seen is obviously, it seems to be obvious, but it's very important, there is a huge congruence of the distribution of, uh, uh, the, of the endangered species and the area with hu high human impact. So clearly, it's clear uh, with this information that the species that are becoming extinct are basically becoming extinct by human activities. And that's very important because uh, uh, there is some group of uh, people, most of them not scientists, who deny the magnitude of the problem or who say that it's a, like a normal uh, part of the evolution process that we lose this species. So this is not the case. And one interesting thing, we are finishing right now a paper and where we just evaluate the most endangered species, a species who the vertebrate who has less than 1,000 individuals left. Just to give you an idea, where we, we were talking, some of these species used to have 1 million individuals in 1900s, and now they have one, less than 1,000. And uh, what is very striking is that uh, these species are concentrated in these areas of high concentration of endangered species, like Southeast Asia, uh, the tropical areas of Africa, the tropical areas of the Americas. Uh, but the other really know, interesting thing... A oh, quick question. How do you know that there's a 1,000 individuals of a given species in an area? Like, you know, have you tagged them all, or how would you know that? Well, that's a good question. Well, we base uh, this in a couple of things. In some of the species, we have our own data, but on the other, we are using the International Union for Conservation of Nature, that is the, this uh, international body who gathers the information, has many, many uh, uh, scientists working with them, more than 2,000 scientists, and in some of the animals, they, they know, based on their own research or, or, or in research done by other individuals, that those species have uh, 1,000 or less individuals. And when you go and look at the database, their database, they, told, they tell you which ones are those species. Then we go out, corrobor corroborate that information, and that's what we know. In a particular case, for instance, in some of the studies that we do in Mexico, we, we count them, as, as you say. We put camera traps, and we estimate okay. the populations of the whole species. Okay, got it. So, uh, sorry so, to interrupt, but okay. what was some of the other No, no, that's fine. That's a good question. Yeah, let, me, let me give you another example. For instance, we did in Mexico I, I recently a census, the first census in any country of jaguars, all the jaguars of Mexico. And to do that, we use camera traps. We do a very solid the statistical design. And then we put camera traps in like a 10 or 15 places in, across the country uh, with exactly the same number of traps, exactly the same design, the same number of days. And then we get that information, we use a statistical analysis, models and so on, and we can estimate with good, good uh, 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 reliability what is the number of jaguars. Just to give you, in 2010, there were, 10, uh, uh, there were 4,000 jaguars in Mexico. In 2018, we have 4,000 acorns. So this kind of, of things is what the people do to estimate the populations. So when I was, what I was telling you is that we find out where are the, the places where they have these uh, uh, populations, these species with so few uh, individuals. And this is uh, important for several reasons. On the one hand, the distribution coincides, as I said, with the areas of human impact, you know, high human impact. On the second, uh, many of these species uh, are uh, distributed in, in other places who are not just of human, high human impact, but they are, they are impacted by uh, illegal trade. One of the big problems that we're looking is illegal trade. The third important part is that we also look at a species who has less than 5,000 individuals. And uh, uh, the 1,000 and 5,000 basically have exactly the same distribution. The 1,000 sp species with uh, less than 1,000 individuals are very likely, unless we do something very a strong conservation measures very strong in the next few uh, years 
they may disappear. And if they disappear, what we can see that there is many more species that will join the ranks of having very few individuals in the following years, unless we do something. So these maps are telling us that uh, uh, the areas of concentrations can be identified, that the species that are in problems are, can be identified, and we can also look at those species to see what is causing their demise, their decline. For instance, we know habitat loss, uh, illegal trade, in some cases, pollution, invasive species. And based on that information, we can say globally how bad is the problem, but also we can identify the causes of the problem and we can try to identify some solutions. So what, what comes to mind so far? I know it depends on the species and the environment, and, but what new ideas are worth trying or being tried to help uh, keep conservation well, going against uh, species? Um, just before I go to that, if you uh, allow me, what I, we have found, and we'll probably talk to this with uh, Professor Ehrlich, is that uh, uh, we have proved, with no doubt, that we have entered in the sixth mass extinction. The animals, the, the vertebrates that we lost in the last 100 years, if they would have lost with the same extinction rate, the norm, what we call, the scientists call the normal extinction rate that occurred in the last 2 million years, in other words, where there was no human impact, you know, uh, the species that were lost in the last 100 years would have been lost in 10,000 years. That's the first thing. So, and when we look at population, not the species, we find out that literally millions and millions of population has been lost in the last 100 years too. So we have entered in the six mass extinctions. So the magnitude of the present extinction crisis it is much larger than even we expected. This is the first, the, the, the most important, I think, uh, uh, result that we have come up with these studies. We are, have entered at the sixth mass extinction. There's five previous ones we call mass extinctions. This uh, uh, catastrophic event where 70% or more of all plants and animals of Earth were killed by a natural catas catastrophe like uh, the impact of a meteorite or the change in the uh, oxygen of the oceans and so on. And there were five previous in the last uh, seven million years. And, this, uh, and, one, and, and they were, geologically speaking, incredibly fast. 10,000 years, I mean, thousands of years or hundreds of thousands of years. The new one, caused by human, is basically geologically instantaneous. And uh, uh, unless we do something, we may lose most of the plants and animals in the planet. And... Uh, because of our activities. And the problem is that if we lose those plants and animals and micro microorganisms, we will lose the capabilities of, of Earth to maintain human life. So that's the most important uh, 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 result. And if you like now, I can go and tell you some of the possible solutions that we think. Yeah, that's what I was going to ask you. Exactly, go ahead. Okay, well, so, so, so we are facing a catas I mean, a problem that uh, humanity has never faced. Uh, existential threat, only comparable probably to uh, climate change on the one hand or a nuclear holocaust. Uh, what can we do? Well, basically, the, the, what is clearly uh, the most important message of our studies is that we need to start to act now. There is no time now, like when I grew up, that we used to say, well, let's uh, teach the children and let's educate the children so they can take decisions in the future when they are grown up. So that's not the case. On the one hand, we'll be very responsible to, to give the, this burden to the children of the world. But on the other hand, there is no time. What we don't do in the next 10, 15, 20 years in terms of saving this diversity, it, it, it won't be done. To give you an example, we lose 100,000 orangutans in the last 10 years. There are 150,000, there were 150,000 orangutans at that time. There are only 50,000 left. At the same rate, we could lose all the orangutans on Earth in the next five, eight years. We lose one uh, elephant illegally poached every 15 minutes. There will probably not work an elephant in the wild in 10 years if this trend continues. So what can we do? So we need to first understand yeah. that there is an incredibly sense of urgency. What we do in the next two decades, it was will determine what is going to be left on Earth in the future. Um, 
So it is very important that we start to try to make the governments of the world, especially the governments of countries like China, like uh, 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 Philippines, like the, uh, Japan, the United States, to curb the illegal trade of a species. Yeah. Uh, Europe, United States, China uh, have a huge appetite for endangered species. And, uh, and especially China in this particular moment is uh, causing the extinctions of so many of these species. So we need to work somehow with the Chinese government and other governments to try to uh, 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 make them to comply with uh, the international laws on endangered species and on trade of species. Um, there are well, illegal you've, trade. You've, I figured the people have spoken to the government of Brazil, the government of China, et cetera. Like, what is the consensus from these various governments on what to do, what not to do, do they care? Like, what, what are you seeing so far? What I see so far, and I, 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 the, first action I, the first action that we need to do that I mentioned is to work with this government is because they are not doing what they have to do. I mean, basically, uh, there are very few governments. Uh, this is a, a part of history of humankind where we will really have to look at the global, at, at the planet, and think about global actions, international global actions, to curb the uh, uh, extinction crisis or the uh, climate change. And unfortunately, what we have seen with governments from all over the country, China, uh, Russia, Brazil, the United States, Mexico, all of them, most of them are taking exactly the opposite uh, solution, I mean, the opposite actions. I mean, the governments are not understanding the severity of the problem, and they are not doing what they have to do. And when I mentioned it has to be, do, has to be done at the government level, because it will be almost impossible for civil society or for uh, a private industry or for whatever to change this unless this government takes action. So um, we are designing a, a, a new strategy called Stop Extinction that will have three major uh, 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 components. And the first component is to, get, to try to get a new international agreement with the most powerful countries who can really change this uh, trend you know, and, and try to uh, and work with them and different issues uh, to try to see uh, if we can, if they can take action. For instance, let me put China as an example. China right now has an economy with trillions of dollars and the illegal trade of all these animals, pangolin, uh, ivory, uh, totuaba, gills, and so on, it probably is around one or two billion dollars a year. Uh, this is nothing for the whole economy of the country to be, if you are, you, you, you are clear, I mean, basically it's so huge that the two, three billion dollars is nothing really. And uh, the government of China, if we convince somebody high up in the hierarchy or the president of China, and uh, how bad the Chinese government is looking in the world, the, how, how bad the Chin, Chinese uh, go, uh, country is being perceived as a major destructor of uh, so many things on earth, it will probably, they can change in relatively very, very fast if uh, somebody high up in the hierarchy take action and decide to stop the, the illegal trade. Because there is no way this illegal trade is uh, happening in China without the authorities knowing. So there will be our well, idea to sit down with them. It's, it's easy, they can just say, you poach, you die, and we kill everyone you know, and then it should stop pretty quick. That's all they'd have to do. Well, that's exactly what, I mean, if the Chinese government will say, because it's so powerful, so hierarchical, they will say, okay, there is no room for illegal trade. They can really stop it. And then if we can praise that at the global level, uh, I think it can happen. We're, we're, we're betting that countries like that, like China, like for, for instance, in the European Union, uh, they can, uh, we can uh, uh, um, even Japan, on the one hand, stop that, but on the other one, get a lot of uh, uh, publicity and a lot of uh, 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 better uh, 
uh, trade and other issues, better trade, so you don't have to destroy the plants and animals on Earth. And one thing that is clear to me is that those governments, you know, I'm sure like the Chinese government doesn't understand that if the whole thing collapsed outside China, there is no way that China can keep on going uh, in the next decade. If this a big collapse, as we expect, uh, a big civilization collapse, if we don't change the way we do things, it doesn't really matter if you have a trillion dollar, trillion dollar economy if the whole world is collapsing around you. And uh, it, so, so the idea is, uh, will be in a stop extinction to try to work with these governments and to try to get the people who know how to work with this government and to do this uh, a, a new commitment to stop extinction. And one thing that is very clear and very important is that we don't need to change the economy of the world at the beginning to curb the, uh, losing so many plants and animals that are essential for our survival. And there is an example, it's also in China, where um, this um, famous uh, uh, basketball player uh, was in a commercial eating, eating uh, um, shark fin soup. And behind him, there was a, there was a shark with no fins dying in a, in, in, in a tank. And just that uh, ad uh, allowed to reduce 70%, 70% the use of uh, uh, the, the consumption of, of, of a child fin soup in China. So I think this can be done. The second part of that is to get involved with a, 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 with a database. We are developing the database. So you will know in any place in the world, in, a, in a, any place in Uzbekistan, Russia, US, or wherever, if you want to take action, you can go look at the database in just one single place, it will tell you if you are interested, let's say, uh, to save uh, uh, orangutans, you know, you will be able to see there what are the groups, what are the uh, groups working on orangutans and you can donate or you can join uh, and do whatever work you can do with them. And you can see what are the areas that nobody is right now protecting and need to be protected. And you will also see other actions that you can take as individuals or as a corporation to uh, 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 contribute to the extinction, to, to, to reduce the extinction problem. We call this the Stop Extinction Pledge. You can take the Stop Extinction Pledge, and, and at that time, you can uh, do many actions from local to regional to national, and then globally, and uh, you can have an impact, a strong impact. And I'll give you an example. The uh, Leuser ecosystem in northern Sumatra is the last last, last, large forest left in all Southeast Asia. It's two and a half million uh, hectares. It is uh, being uh, uh, saved because it's very rock, but now uh, it is being destroyed to crop, to put uh, crops of uh, uh, crops. And, but to save the whole place, we will need like $30 million a year. It's really nothing. And uh, we think that sometimes some companies, some philanthropies, some countries, once we put this, all this together and see what are the most important places, and you can see that in just one, in, in, in a single web, web page, in a single application, so we can guide the public, the institutions, the companies to uh, be able to take these uh, very important actions without having to uh, rely in uh, spending hours and hours to try to decide where to go. And, uh, so, so this is, this is uh, some things we're doing. We're pushing very hard for instance, protecting parks in Mexico and other places, global conservation that is a, a, a small NGO that I am a part of the scientific uh, advising, advisory board is working uh, in right now more than 12 uh, protected, very important protected areas across the world. And, uh, what they are doing is they are providing training uh, for guards and they are uh, putting a very sophisticated uh, uh, surveillance uh, that would help uh, methods that would help to uh, identify uh, poachers and uh, illegal activities in the reserves. And to give you an idea of how, how fascinating this is, it's, uh, you can see within 10, I mean, let's say this, uh, this poachers goes into one protected area in Saba that we are working in, 
there was nothing, nobody there. There were no guards, no nothing. So the poaches were like in heaven until two years ago. Now, when they go into the reserve, within 20 minutes, the information is in the headquarters. And then most of the time, in one hour, one and a half hour, the poachers are being caught and, and, and arrested. So these kind of things are, 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 have to be done on the ground. If on the one hand, we manage the government to do what they have to do. On the other hand, we, we manage to protect better the areas, uh, the protected areas will be great. And finally, all the regions that are not protected but have, are very important for biodiversity, we need to find out incentives for conservation. Mm -hmm. And here in Mexico, just to give you an idea, we run a small NGO called Friends of Calakmul. Calakmul is the last, la, the largest and last uh, 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 tropical, the largest tropical forest left in Mexico. And we are been working with owners of that, paying them environmental services or ecosystem services for uh, conserving their, their forest. And they are very happy to do so. Once the local people receive uh, some benefit for protecting the area. People receive a benefit for, for protecting the local area. But if, before we go oh, into yeah. that, I want to ask you one quick question. If you were to rank the reasons for population decline, what are the biggest ones? Is it loss of habitat? Is it poaching? Like, how do you rank the, what are the causes and how do you rank them? Okay, well, the, the, the most important uh, causes right now for the decline of populations and species, wild population and species on Earth, are uh, the habitat loss and fragmentation. It's a, well, the, the most important problem is the uh, 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 habitat loss and fragmentation, you know, and the second is uh, overexploitation and illegal trade. We are killing, for instance, two. I mean, we are depleting the, the fisheries throughout the world. You know, we're just fishing too much. We're harvesting too much of many species of plants and animals. But also the illegal trade. The illegal trade has become uh, it's very important in the sense that produces a ton, lots of money for the bad guys uh, on the one hand. But also most of the uh, countries have very uh, weak uh, legal actions against the poachers, you know, against the, against the illegal uh, exploitations of plants and animals. And the third uh, problem is uh, uh, pollution, I mean, pollution and toxification. Uh, on the one hand, we're putting too much plastic, for instance, in the ocean, we all know that. But on the other hand, we're putting literally hundreds, I mean, every year they say that it's 100,000 new uh, chemical products put into the uh, uh, em environment. And there is a really, a very, very recent report by the, I think it's the UN, they say that one, another major threat for humanity is toxification. We are really, really uh, uh, making very uh, uh, dangerous our uh, water, our soil, our uh, uh, air is being polluted well, by really uh, nasty uh, compounds, chemical compounds, and that's a major threat for uh, wildlife too. And finally, invasive species. i give you an example from the United States. The Burmese python was uh, intro uh, accidentally introduced in the Florida. Now it is estimated that more than one million Burmese pythons are in the Everglades and they have decimated the animals of there, of the Everglades National Park. They have practically wiped out populations of birds, mammals, like raccoons, rabbits, otters, all of these are basically gone. And uh, those animals are spreading north to uh, Georgia, and eventually they will have the capability to be in many of the places in the U.S. and then go down to Mexico. And once you have a species like that, that is an invasive species and uh, is successful in colonizing an area, usually they become like pests because like this Burmese uh, python don't have the diseases or the predators that have in their uh, native uh, Asia, native habitat in Asia, so they can uh, multiply really fast without having any uh, uh, species or diseases to control them. 
And yeah. once you have like one million pythons in an Everglade, it's impossible to eradicate them. Hmm. Right. So, yeah, what are the, in light of what you know and what you see and the major factors, what's the best plan going forward? What, uh, what have you taken that upon yourself to do? Well, the, the, we're taking us, uh, what we want to do is, is this, this uh, at the global level, this uh, stop extinction uh, movement, uh, project, you know, where we are going to have these three, three points that I mentioned. One is to uh, try to get this agreement with the uh, most important government that can uh, reduce the legal trade of uh, endangered species. The second, at the same time, get uh, the public uh, or companies, corporations involved in extinction place where they can do uh, many actions to try to reduce this threat. And finally, to do a massive campaign of publicity and to make the general public globally to understand that the extinction crisis is as bad as global warming, most, but most urgent because it's happening now really fast. And it's also the only environmental problem that is really irreversible. Uh, once you lose a species, there is no way you can get it back. So that's what I'm doing. And uh, more locally in Mexico, what we are doing is uh, pushing as hard as we can to try to get all the uh, uh, natural habitat protected or not in the country. Uh, we're doing, uh, trying to do an effort to keep them as a natural habitat because that's the only way to safeguard the uh, uh, well-being of the Mexican people. So in other words, uh, you see the big fires in California and Baja California in Mexico and so on. And those are caused by, among other things, changes in climate. But when you lose the forest, you don't have the water, you don't have the wildlife, you don't have the protection of the trees uh, against uh, erosion, or a big uh, uh, mud, uh, landslide, and so on. So we are con trying to convince the government and different sectors of society and the public uh, sector that we need to do an effort to protect all these uh, species and all these uh, uh, regions with good vegetation, natural vegetation, tropical forests, mangroves, uh, pine forests, etc. because that's the best way to protect ourselves. And one thing that we all should be thinking about and now is not to try to stop the fires because it will be impossible to stop them. It's how we adapt them, what we have to do to prevent them, not in the way we used to do to prevent them until now. This is a new dynamic. This is a new normal. So we need to think and we need to develop strategies to adapt to these uh, changing uh, 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 times. And for doing that, it's very important that the public, the government, understand that keeping as much as possible the natural habitat and the species is uh, one, of the way, one of the most critical ways to go. And we have enorm enormous benefits for humans. And having said so, the, the, the other part that we need to really think about it is that it has to be, we need to, to, to stop the population, the human population growth we need to change our consumption patterns. We are really using too much. And we need to use, we really push forward. We need to push forward a strongly use of, of cleaner technologies like solar or, or, or solar, solar energy. You give an example also from Mexico. Mexico right now has probably the cheapest wind and solar energy on the world because the government has invested a lot on that. But the new government, uh, who has been in, in, in power for in the last 10 months, just has stopped uh, incentivating the uh, production of uh, this green energy and uh, is uh, trying to develop, for instance, of carbo carboelectric plants. That is a, a, a step, well, it's many steps backwards in the policy. So we are trying to work with them to make them understand that it's not the way to go. It doesn't make sense economically, it doesn't make sense socially, it doesn't make sense environmentally, and it doesn't make sense politically. So, so what this is, is the, the kind uh, of thing that we... A, a quick question. When you look at um, habitat loss, what is the shape of the habitat mm -hmm. that's left? Is it like a lot of little pieces or is it one area that's 
you know, let's say circular and keeps shrinking? Like, what does it look like and how does that affect the creatures in it? Um, well, yes. Uh, once you have a big area, let's say you have a big area like in the Amazon. In the Amazon, there are still so very, very large chunks of forest. So when you start to encroach the forest, there are two things that happen. On the one hand, you just uh, literally lost some forest. You go, go clear, cut the forest, burn it, and put crops or pastures. So the, the whole habitat, the whole forest is gone, okay? Or the fires in, 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 uh, in California, the big fires come and destroy everything, so the, the habitat is completely gone. Uh, but then there is also, uh, uh, as you correctly mentioned, uh, places where you don't lose the whole habitat, you lose pieces of the habitat and uh, of, of the region. And what you are left with is with um, uh, smaller uh, places, smaller habitats. And by definition, the smaller habitats will uh, be able to maintain a, a, a lower number of individuals, lower number of species. And if you have less individuals of a species that are more vulnerable to extinction for both natural reasons like a disease, for instance, or human caused reasons like hunting. So if you have a large population, it is more uh, less prone to extinction than uh, smaller populations. And in that particular case, it is very important to maintain large habitat, uh, um, I mean, habitat as large as possible uh, right now. This is critical. The more, the larger they are, the better they will be to uh, uh, face a climate disruption and human activity. Uh, so in many cases, and this is what we have been done in many, uh, in your country and Mexico and other places, is uh, a habitat that has been, pieces of habitat that have been isolated, uh, we're now trying to connect them by bands of uh, reconstructed or restored habitat. So a smaller uh, habitat become a larger a functional unit. But the most important thing to understand, both in, in land and in the ocean, is that human is, uh, uh, nature is so complex that the best way to uh, really uh, preserve nature and preserve plants and animals is to have functional ecosystems as they have existed for millions of years, instead of trying to recreate them. Um, so, so it is important, very important to maintain as much our habitat as possible. Now. There is an initiative by some people in the United States and Europe that they are calling for maintaining 50% of all, the 50% of all earth that still has more or less habitat uh, in certain degrees of con good conservation to keep it for wildlife and plants. And I think that's a sensible thing to do uh, because the more we maintain in natural condition, the better we are humans to uh, be able to cope with, uh, to try to cope with climate change and all other environmental problems that we are facing. Well, very good. Well, Dr. Sabayos, what, what are some resources for people so they can learn about the scale of the problem and the specifics of it and then figure out how they can somehow contribute and help? Well, on the one, on the one hand, for instance, uh, people like you and your podcast, it's very important that we uh, that you uh, devote this time to publicize the problem. I mean, right now, as I say, there are uh, the urgency of the problem is being uh, starting to be uh, distributed in the uh, social networks. The UN recently published a, a, a report uh, last month that indicate that up to one million species may become extinct in the next decades unless we do something. And that was very important. It was everywhere in the newspapers and the social media and so on. So we need to keep on working on that. The BBC and David Attenborough has an amazing a series called One Planet that really shows the beauty of this place and the problems that we're facing. And uh, in our particular case, we are developing full force now our project Stop Extinction and you can look at it www.stopextinctions.org. And in that, we will basically uh, uh, have many things that you have to, you can do. But for the, uh, just for anybody who's interested in the project in, in, in extinction on the environment, if you go in the internet and you put something like 50 ways to help endangered species or 50 ways to help the environment, you will find 
literally hundreds of web pages that give you good examples, good, good ideas. What we can say here to most of, the, of, 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 the, of your audience is, uh, on the one hand, uh, the less uh, children you have, the better. On the second hand is if you consume less, uh, f- fewer things and you consume more, your consumption is more uh, uh, conscious, more based on reason, you will be doing a big, uh, uh, you can have a big impact to, to uh, say, nature. For instance, uh, I would suggest nobody should buy any uh, wild animal as pet. No iguanas, no geckos, no snakes, you know, because this is causing massive loss of species. So uh, you, you shouldn't have a pet endangered species. You shouldn't buy any product that involves endangered species. If you are a little more savvy and you have more time to look, for instance, you can go out in the internet and do some research also and find out, for instance, you shouldn't buy products that have palm oil that is not coming from certified uh, uh, crops because palm oil is one right now probably the, the, the major culprit of destroying the last uh, forest in Asia and, and, and in Africa. So that's, that's very important. So uh, you can, the, the general public can go in the internet and can find guidance on how to do. The other important thing in Mexico, in the U.S. and where, is to when you vote, thinking that you should vote for the people who has a better understanding on how a bath is the problem and who is willing to act. As I say, there is a backlash now, government, Mexico, U.S., uh, Brazil, Russia, China, etc., who don't care about the environment the way they should do. But it's us, the people who is facing, who's facing already these tremendous problems and who is facing the possibility that within our lifetime, the whole civilization will collapse, that will change the course by our vote. We should also get involved locally and regionally it with the government and with the uh, uh, groups who work for the environment and do whatever can, can, we can do to help them and contribute to uh, save the condition. And my final, my final, I will say something that may sound a, a little bit tough, but I have a, a final advice in this particular case. One thing, we should stop to be, become spectators of the problem. We need to become actors. And unfortunately, in terms of the environment, we are really far behind from actors in other areas, you know? And so we have to become actors. And the, 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 the second thing I'd like to say, things are going to become incredibly difficult for all of us in terms of the environment. Very, very difficult. What we see in the fires in the Amazon, Indonesia, California, Mexico, is just something I wish going to be probably even much worse in the future. So we have to understand that so we have to be, become and change our uh, attitudes to become more into the adaptive mode. We need to understand that we need to have adaptation, both at the individual and the society and the government level. So we have to predict that this is going to happen. So we need to be not to, not to, to, to stop it when it's happening, but to prevent it. And finally, uh, every day that is still like normal in our community, we should enjoy it because things are going to change really, really, really fast, and it will be harder for all of us. Well, I, I appreciate you coming. Um, the best way for people to find out you gave, and then if you wish anyone to get in touch with you, is there a website or anything that they can go to? Yeah, yeah. It should be the website, the, the Stop Extinction website. Um, it's www.stopextinctions.org, okay? And also, they can see my uh, uh, my lab uh, and uh, my if you go into the internet you can find out there what is my email anybody can get uh, uh, in contact through email with me and i will be very happy to to reply okay i don't say here because it's difficult to, to spell it <laughs> in That's english right. but uh, it's okay it's okay yeah. i can say anything well, that just survives. thank you so much for coming well i thank you very much for you and uh, uh, thank mm-hmm. you for taking uh, interest in these issues. Just to, yeah. to end up, I think there is a still time to, to act and we should act now. Excellent. You're listening to the Future Tech Health Podcast with Richard Jacobs. 
Until I reached age 40, I never realized the obvious, that we all have medical issues, or we at least have a family member or close relation that had, has, or will have them in the future. Medicine and biological systems are the final frontier. Until we've conquered death, figured out how life began, cured cancer, and understood our purpose in the universe, there's a heck of a lot to talk about when it comes to our health. Future Tech Health means I'll be covering futuristic topics that are actually already in clinical trials, or even starting to appear on shelves, or by prescription, or available for your own use. We dive deep into stem cells, CRISPR-Cas9, the science of sleep, epigenetics, medical testing, cancer, ketogenic diets, stem cells, aging, regenerative medicine, and more. My goal for you, the listener, is to learn from these podcasts. You may very well learn something that may change the course of your life for the better, steer you towards a new career, or give you insight into addressing a serious medical problem. Remember, however, this podcast and its content is informational in nature only. No medical, tax, legal, financial, or psychological advice is being given. If you enjoy the podcast, please listen, subscribe, like, and share it with friends. Thank you.